time we're going to start our discussion of agent-based models. Pointing to this as kind of uh, an area of uh, contrast and an area where one can can recognize some differences between the approaches. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I, I I should have posted them to the um, to the wiki. And in fact, what I think I'll do is to um, uh, thank you for um, for reminding me of that. I will go actually post these right now. Uh, as we're, we're speaking. I think I still have the wiki. Um, uh, oops. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Um, wiki. No, not Wikipedia. Other wiki. Um, Wiki.usask. Let's see. Because uh, I did modify these um, a little bit, and um, and they're, th they'll be a little bit different from anything you find uh, online right now. Um, go um, and I'll go in and post them in the uh, in the lecture lecture area well okay I'll just I'll just post them to the main page right now and I'll have to go back and and futz with them so I'll go to attachments and attach these files Classes. boom and then lectures PDF and then infectious disease models um, okay, and infectious aggregate infectious disease models. Um, so this is on the wiki. If any of you don't know about this wiki, let me know, um, and I'll I'll make sure that you have access. Okay. Um, yep, you bet. Okay, so um, we're going to also see within this lecture a nexus of mathematics on the one hand and dynamic modeling in a little bit more detail. Um, and uh, what you'll see here is something that opens opportunities for extra insight and flexibility if you're interested in learning some more of the extra math mathematics. There's some uh, people who are extremely proficient within the mathematical side of, of um, infectious disease modeling and use that to great advantage to reason in a fairly general way about the properties of this model. However, I should note many accomplished and well-published modelers have have limited mathematical background, um, and can you could still do it a lot. Uh, you could still get a lot of insight, uh, even with a lot of, without a, a, a strong depth on the mathematical side. Um, mathematical models of infectious diseases um, began as a tradition with the work in 1920s by uh, Ross and Kermick and McKendrick. Uh, Ross should really be credited here first because he had a model associated with malaria. Uh, during that uh, that same era that actually predated Kermick and McKendrick's work. Um, so uh, starting in the 1920s, people um, were putting together what amount to uh, differential equation or stock and flow formulations of these models. And since that point, these models have proliferated in terms of the number of distinct situations to which they've been applied. The, the particular types of research questions they seek to answer, the types of data that they incorporate, et cetera. And there's an important tradition here of using um, uh, tools from applied mathematics to gain insight with respect to these models. And we'll see glimpses of that today. What do these models commonly include? Well, they typically include some representation of mixing. Here we're talking about mixing of individuals, contact patterns between individuals and a representation of the transmission likelihood associated with that. Maybe this is transmission of a pathogen, like influenza. Maybe it's transmission of an idea. Um, uh, they also often show the development of and, and loss of immunity over time. So uh, the fact that once infected and recovered, you're not susceptible to infection again. There are important examples. Um, uh, where that's not, not the case. There are some bugs that mutate very quickly. Um, what would be an example of a bug that mutates quickly enough that you can get it more than once in a fairly short period of time? I'm not saying you. <laughs> some of these bugs, you might not want to step forward and say I'm, I'm subject to it again. But, um, uh, 
one bug that mutates quite quickly, the outer membrane protein mutates, uh, I'm told, is, is gonorrhea, right? Um, chlamydia is another example where there's believed to be shorter term immunity. These are both sexually transmitted infections, but it's not limited to that. Those are both bacterial sexually transmitted infections. But uh, what's another bug that mutates quite enough, so at least once a year you have to worry about being infected by it? Influenza, yeah. yeah. Just because you got it last year doesn't mean that you are immune to it this year. It's actually mutating quite quickly as well. Um, often there's a representation of natural, well, typically there's a representation of the natural history, often a multi-stage progression and um, some recovery from, uh, from infection. Neil, can you see the uh, slides there? Are you still having trouble seeing them? Uh, okay, good. Um, birth and migration, aging and mortality, and some representation of interventions. What are some interventions that might make a difference in lowering the burden of infection um, for a communicable illness? Vaccination is a great one. What's another one? Education, yeah. So education about hygiene, for example, <coughs> washing your hands. Um, uh, another thing would be uh, some sort of thing that leads to social distance. Shutting down schools is a more drastic one that was considered during the pandemic. Things that are sometimes included are, are shown over here, and um, there's a wide variety of them, and they include detailed representation of immune response, something that our group has worked on, preferential mixing, reflecting the fact that people say if you consider a people by age groups, people of uh, a given age group are often more likely to circulate in people of that same age group think school kids, circulating more among school kids um, than you know adults will, will circulate among school kids, etc. Variability in, con in context, uh, changes in behavior and attitude, um, risk perception, the fact that I might change my behavior if a bunch of people around me are infected but I'm not yet infected. And we're gonna see there's a bunch of emergent characteristics that come out with infectious disease models that include instability. By instability, I mean things can rapidly accelerate for the worse or actually for the better. Nonlinearity, um, it's, uh, these sorts of models are, uh, are very difficult to solve uh, directly, and in fact, uh, in general, they can't be solved so-called analytically. You can't write down a formula that describes how it changes. You have to simulate it. They exhibit tipping points. These are points where a small difference could lead to the disease either disappearing or, or staying at, at reasonably high levels within a population, for example. They can exhibit oscillations and, and multiple, multiple what we call fixed points, situations where it's in stasis, but either in an, uh, an unhealthy or a healthy state, but where it's stable, where it, it resists change. So here's some examples. Instability. Um, this was uh, quite notable for childhood infections like uh, chickenpox, measles, mumps, rubella, um, pertussis where you get these sort of spikes every few years traditionally until vaccination um, uh, led to or essentially uh, greatly dampened, uh, dampened oscillations or greatly dampened dynamics. Um, so these oscillations are associated with um, negative feedback uh, loops with delays. Um, Basically, there'll be a buildup associated with uh, susceptibles, people who haven't yet gotten the infection, and then there'll be a wave of infection that infects those susceptibles, and then that number of people who are susceptible drops so much the infection can't um, can't stay uh, can't stay circulating effectively or can't spread efficiently, to put it another way, and the number of infections drops remarkably low until the fact until the susceptibles have built up again. And we're gonna talk through in some specifics, and it's a very interesting illustration of stock and flow reasoning. So the oscillations are associated with, uh, with feedbacks, um, and they exhibit in a very powerful way sort of uh, reasoning at the stock and flow level. So here's measles and, and chicken pox in Saskatchewan, um, mumps, um, mumps and measles, uh, whooping cough, et cetera. 
Um, here's uh, measles in England, for example, um, weekly cases of measles. And you can see it wasn't quite like clot work, but it was down to something like a, um, a five-year cycle, something on, on that order. Um, because of the nonlinearity, multiple policies can yield synergistic or dinergistic results. What I mean by that is if you have an amount of gain from policy A and an amount of gain from policy B, and you combine them, the result may be very different than the results of each just added together. They can yield multiplicative effects where they're hugely reinforcing, or they could almost cancel each other out. Um, and that's a reflection of, of the nonlinearity of the situation. Um, doubling investment, say in vaccination, does not yield doubling of results. You might have a much more aggressive vaccination campaign, and it could go from a situation where the disease remains present at a reasonably strong level to where it, it, it disappears. It can't stay uh, in a persistent way within the population. Okay, um, right, and um, we can have these tipping points between what are called basins of attraction. The system could be attracted to go in one direction and get in this stable situation or in this other situation um, and go to a different place. It's almost as if you were to take a uh, marble and go to the Rockies, uh, if you were to go to the border between BC and Alberta, and you were to stand by the Columbia ice fields, for example. Um, within a very small, small distance here, I think it's within a kilometer or so, um, you could either have water going down to the Pacific, water going to the Arctic, or, or water flowing out to um, Hudson Bay and from there to the Atlantic. And there's actually ridges where if you put that marble, it rolls down one way, it goes to the Pacific, one way goes out to the Atlantic. Um, so very, very close areas, and so when you have a tipping point like that, it's very attractive to identify it, because if you're dealing with a, um, if you're dealing with an intervention, designing a policy, you might be able to invest just a little bit more and have the situation radically change, completely change for the better. And there's situations like this, uh, if you look historically, um, situations where diseases that have been uh, prolific have almost disappeared. Um, a famous case is, for example, after discovery of the causes of cholera in England. The Broad Street Pump example, where it was discovered that water contamination was behind cholera. Methods were designed to undertake that, and cholera went to a, to a minor problem status within England. Um, another example would be the sorts of infections we saw here in Saskatchewan. You notice that these end not coincidentally in about the mid-50s here. Here's 1945, 45. And why do you think that is? Why, why do these time series sort of all end mid-century? Mandatory vaccination, yeah. yeah. Now the sad truth is that um, <coughs> after many, many decades of being at, at very low levels during, during vaccination, um, after decades of uh, essentially being snuffed out at a, at a practical level within, within Saskatchewan, having only occasionally um, occasional blips, and you now start to see this sort of rise. Does anyone have a conjecture as to why you see this rise here in the number of, of uh, whooping cough um, uh, cases? Sorry? Yeah, people don't get vaccinated. And there's a variety of reasons for it, but there's skepticism. And ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons for the skepticism is what? Well, okay, there's many reasons for skepticism. And uh, this could get into some interesting pathological political discussions, but, um, but one of the reasons for the skepticism is an aspect of negative feedback. And what is that? Yeah, so what's to worry about? Why do we have to get our kids vaccinated, go through all this rigmarole and hassle of bringing their kids to the vaccination clinic and you know in some jurisdictions like in the states you know you may be paying out quite a lot to get your kids vaccinated and why? You never see it. Why do we need this? Right? Um, skepticism because it's been so 
thoroughly dampened out by policy. So people get complacent, don't vaccinate the kids, and the kids end up getting infected in some cases. But what's more dangerous there is that often the kids who are getting infected late in, in this period here are getting infected at later ages, older, when the damage is more severe. It turns out a lot of these childhood infections, if you get them as a child, it's pretty safe. If you get them as an adult, it can cause serious damage, particularly reproductive damage, um, infertility, um, problems in both men and women, so um, for different, different conditions. Okay, so um, we're talking here about uh, situations where the, uh, where the infection status can change radically between a one equilibrium, disease-free, and an endemic equilibrium. Okay, um, so this is an example of sort of dramatic drop in TB within Saskatchewan after fighting it, um, SDI's rates. And what you could see is actually a situation where um, this, is, this is a more stylized model that I work mm -hmm. with. And here, what we've done is mapped out a sort of paths. This, this is a representation in a graphical form of, of a differential equation and its flow lines. What I mean by that is if you'll, you'll notice these arrows on the diagram here. And if you were to put down a marble you can imagine these as kind of indicating where that marble would roll, okay? And what we see here is a situation where a slightly different original placement could lead to that marble either rolling up, up to this region or, or rolling down here. Now, this may seem very abstract, but what this is showing along the y-axis is the number of infectious people and the x-axis is the number of susceptible. So what this is, is indicating here is that if we went from um, uh, some number of, of uh, healthcare workers, a fixed number of healthcare workers with a certain number of infective individuals, um, here the infection would die out in this stylized uh, example. Essentially you'd go, go it, would, it would decrease in terms of the number of people infected and and essentially go to, to zero. Whereas with a slightly larger number of initial infected people, the infection will take off to a larger and larger number of, of infected individuals over time. So this is a representation in graphical form of a differential equation. Um, and uh, this one happens to consider how long you wait for to be treated um, for an infection. So the number of healthcare workers is important for how quickly you're able to secure treatment within this model. But we can see this kind of tipping point effect. Very, very small differences in initial conditions um, can lead to, to big, big differences in outcomes, qualitative differences in outcomes. And of course, as a, what I'm not showing here um, from a healthcare system perspective is going from this situation where the infection is taking off to this situation where it's, uh, whoa, where it's dying out, it might also be obtained by adding healthcare workers into the situation. So just by adding a few more healthcare workers, you might nip it in the button. <coughs> okay, so we're gonna discuss now a, a, a classic model within this area. It's called the kermick mckendrick model. And basically it consists of a partition of the population into three broad categories. We've referred to this before, but we're gonna go into the some of the mathematics of it, susceptible, infectious, and removed individuals. And we use the terms S, I, and R, okay? Um, and a depiction of this model, a particularly simple version of it, has uh, susceptibles, infectives, and recovers with a uh, single sort of linear chain between them of flows. And there's some mean time until recovery, or mean time with disease as it's shown here. Um, that affects the number of uh, the rate at which infectives move to recovered. And then there's a more complicated process involving this force of infection here. And we're going to come back to that. But suffice it to say, people start predominantly in susceptible. Some will get infected and go on to recovered. Some will actually remain in the susceptible state for a very, very large time. 
And we're going to use some notation for this. I or Y will denote, denote the number of infectives in the population, N to be the total size of the population, and S, and sometimes you'll see X denoting the number of susceptible individuals within the population. Okay? Now, to analyze this and to see the underlying mathematics of it and to build a model, we're going to just um, uh, use some abbreviations. So instead of having this model here um, with, with these labels in it, what we're going to do is to give them short names. So um, we're, going to, we're going to give uh, very brief names that we can write down in a, in a um, succinct form in the, the next slot, I believe it is. So at a mathematical level, these are the underlying equations. And we're going to go about putting this into a model. But um, this is the rate of change in susceptibles. Um, sort of what's the net rate of, uh, what's the net change in susceptibles per unit time? How quickly is it going up or if negative going down? And what we see here, I just want to go through this because this will be our, our last chance. This is. Um, uh, the last real topic we'll be talking about with aggregate models. So I want to see the relationship between this and the underlying stock and flows. So this M here is uh, representing immigration into susceptibles. And remember, these are rates. These are people per unit time. So the rate of change of S, ds dt, we could write it as, uh, here, is equal to M, that's the flow in, and then minus, why is it a minus here? Well, let me ask this. What is this whole term, what must that represent? If we look back here, what must that represent? The color also gives it away. Um, so if we're considering S, we have M coming in. And then what else is affecting S? What other rate is affecting S? The incidence here. Yeah, the incidence. And it's colored in blue. And you'll notice that it's, it's reproduced both here and here. Why is this reproduced here and here? Why do we see this twice? It's exactly the same term. In fact, it has to be the, the term given the stock and flow model. Why? Why do we see this term twice? Yeah, exactly. It's an outflow from S that's an inflow term. And similarly, the red term, why do we see that twice? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's an outflow from I and inflow to R. Why the minus signs here? Should have been more, more consistent with that. Why the minus signs? Like, why is there a minus sign in front of uh, this thing right here? And why is there a minus sign here? Because it's... Uh, an outflow, and therefore, the larger it is, the more the stock is going to be drop. The quicker the stock will be dropping over time. Right? Um, it's associated with a negative polarity with the associated stock. So, the larger the incidence rate of people per unit time, the, the lower the net rate of change of S. Mm -hmm. um, so. So this is an example of sort of the underlying mathematics of this. We're now going to go talk um, about where these formulas come from, OK? Um, and I'd like to talk about each of them. And then we're going to go build a little model of this. OK, so let's talk about the key quantities here. Um, so there are several parameters that are denoted here. C, uh, what it, C which is context per susceptible, beta which is per contact risk of infection, and this mu, this average duration of, of infection, or average duration of, of average time till recovery. And I'm going to bring that over so it's, it's oh, oh, that's what it was covering up. Um, OK. Um, there we go. Um, so let's, let's talk about that. The most important of them concern those uh, ones at the beginning. The first is C, contacts per susceptible per unit time. OK, so if we're considering a susceptible an individual in the population, um, they're going to have contacts with a certain number of people per whatever your unit of time is. If the unit of time across the model is months, it'll be per month, 20 people per month. Maybe 
number of sexual partners per month. Um, maybe C is day, and we're dealing with influenza, and it might be 20 per day for influenza, for contacts close enough to spread influenza. Dylan has more information on, on contact patterns of that sort. Um, so this is number of contacts a given person, and, and by extension, susceptible will have with it. But we're assuming here that it's kind of the same for susceptibles and infectives. We could introduce extra complexity that would be different. That's the assumption here. Okay, so that's that's one of the key parameters. Persons per day per person in the population. Yeah. Okay, the other key one is beta. Okay. Um, so the idea here is if a susceptible comes into contact with an infective. If I sit next to Jim and I'm infective, what's the chance that he'll get infected within that, that given contact? What's the chance he'll he'll walk out if you're infected? Uh, that's that's beta. So if there is a contact between a susceptible and infective, what's the chance that it's actually transmitted, okay? So the per contact likelihood that a pathogen will be transmitted from an infective to a susceptible with whom they come into contact. So if this were instead a model of spread of ideas, could you see this as applying for spread of ideas? Yeah? So this, this sort of context might be a little bit harder to define, but if we're dealing with people at a distance, it might include, you know, uh, phone calls and Twitter messages and um, blog postings or email messages or what have you, contacts. And then each contact might have a certain chance of, of transmitting um, uh, transmitting an idea. It, it, it could be. Um, uh, so one, one could think about applying it there, or it could be ads that you're exposed to and chance of of getting somehow stimulated enough by that ad to make you want to buy the thing being promoted or what have you. Okay, um, so so those are our key two key parameters. Are there any questions about those parameters? Okay, so C. So so let me make sure you've been listening. What is C? What is C here? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's the contact rate. So how many people, it's a given person in the population, say susceptible, coming into contact with per unit of time. If that's really large, I may be in a bus station, right? Tons of people coming past me. I'm coming into contact with a lot of lot of people. On the other hand, if I'm standing up there in my land, uh, in open fields surrounding me, maybe zero. No one coming into contact with me. I might have Ebola. I, I don't, but, but I might have Ebola and you know, no one's gonna have, have a chance of getting it from me. Um, between me and the, and the trees. Um, okay, what's beta? Yeah, so if there is that contact, so given that I'm in contact with someone, what's that chance of transmission? Good. Okay, so now we're going to put these into, into some pieces. So suppose N is the total population. Here it would be susceptible plus infected plus recovered, the number of each. But in general, if we have a, a population, N, I over N, what does that represent? What does I over N represent? What would I over N represent? That's in fact, right? Fraction that's in fact. Fraction that you have to worry about being around, right? Okay. Um, how about C times I over N? I'm trying to make you think here. It's not, I, I know it's, it's <laughs> sort of, well, uh, I guess it, well, yeah, maybe it is in my case. Um, what is C times I over N? Can anyone give that an in, in intuition? So consider me, I'm as susceptible, and I'm, and I'm in contact with, with uh, 100 people per day, close enough to, to get a transmission of, of influenza. Does that 
Should that cause me to worry? Definitely. No, why not? Because, yeah, there may be very few infectives around. So, if my rate of contact with other people is 100 people per day, to, to try to figure out how, it, how much at risk I am, one thing I have to do is take into account how many infectives are around me. What is this, what would C times one over, uh, I over N be? Anyone give that an interpretation? If I over N, suppose that's one. Everyone in the population is infected. And I come in as a new susceptible to that population. Should I be worried? Well, yeah, yeah I might be worried. Matters what beta is, too, and we're going to get to that. But, but yeah, there's good reason to worry. If I over N is zero, there ain't nobody in the population already infected. Should I be worried? No. Okay, so one step towards figuring out how worried I should be, figuring out how big the force of infection is that affects me, that, that puts me at risk. One way of doing that is to look at C times I over N, okay? Um, and can anyone give an intuition as to what that means in concrete terms? So if I meet 100 people in the course of the day, what's C times... And, and let's suppose half the population is infected. So I over N is 0.5. So half the population is infected. What, what, what's the intuition behind C times I over N? Yeah, exactly. In the course of that day, I run into C times I over N infected people on average, right? Now that's making some leaps of assumptions here, and we're going to come back to that in a big way probably next time, our next lecture when we start an agent-based modeling. But, but C times I over N here, um, it's using an approximation saying, well, you know, if I'm a susceptible, and, you know, and I'm considering I come into contact with C people per unit time, and if we look at the whole population and I over N fraction of it is infected, then, you know, my number of contacts per day with infected people, infective people is probably C times I over N, like people per day, say per unit you know, per day. So um, there, 50% of the population is infected, and I come into contact with 100 people per day close enough to transmit infection, were they infected, I'm coming into contact with 50 infectious people per day on average is the idea. Okay, so that's sort of the contact, the number of infectious people with whom a susceptible comes into infected. And then we multiply it times beta. And it turns out, for those who are familiar with probability theory, this is an approximate. So we're kind of assuming that each of those contacts has an independent chance of transmitting the infection. And for each of those contacts with an infectious person, what's my chance of getting infected? If I consider a given one of those contacts, what's my chance? So I'm a susceptible, and I come into contact with, with an infectious person. What's my chance of getting infected? It is, we gave it a short name. Short name that even the Greeks would have recognized. <laughs> beta. Beta. So, so for each of those contacts, I have a beta chance to get infected. So, so my, we, we approximate the chance that got infected from any of those contacts to C times I over N times beta. Okay? Um, this is approximately the likelihood of given success will be infected per unit time. Why do I say approximate? Because if you've already been infected by one, you're not going to get infected by the other. And, um, and it's it's not going to actually scale quite like that. But if beta is very small, it's a very good approximation. If it's like 1% chance. Um, you know, I think per sexual act, HIV trans is transmitted with a likelihood of, well, it's below 1%. You know, it's, it's, it's quite, quite small. So, um, and similarly for influenza, if I'm standing in line next to someone at Tim Hortons or, you know, next to someone in class, the chances pretty small per contact um, that, that it will lead to, to transmission, okay? 
So here, the idea is if a given susceptible comes in contact with C times I over N infectives per unit time, and if each such contest gives beta likelihood of transmission of infection, the susceptible roughly has a total likelihood of C times I over N times beta um, getting infected per month, okay? So, um, okay, so, so this is, suppose we want to use the C times I over N times beta as the chance of getting infected per unit time. So that's a given susceptible chance of getting infected per unit time. So let me ask this. If that is the average chance of a susceptible getting infected per unit time, how many susceptibles get infected per unit time total? That's the chance a given susceptible get infected on average per unit time. How many susceptibles are there? There are, what do we labeled that in our model? We labeled it S, S. So how many susceptibles on average will get infected per unit time then? S times C times I over N times beta. And that C times I over N times beta times S, right? That, that's where that comes from. It otherwise looks, can look kind of mysterious, but that's all it is. So, so we consider how many each of these susceptibles, how many people they total come into contact with per day, say. We multiply that times the fraction of all those people in the population that are infected, I over N, are infective. That will give us that how many infective people they come into contact with per day times beta, that's a chance per contact that they'll get infected. And that gives what's called the force of infection, which we multiply times S, okay? So, um, so uh, we talk about a force of infection is the likelihood a given susceptible will be infected per unit time. That's S, that's, excuse me, that is, uh, yeah, so the likelihood is C times I over N times beta. And to figure out how many susceptibles get infected per unit time, it's S times that likelihood, times that force of infection. Now, notably, this is a term, this may not seem significant, but it makes the world of difference in terms of analysis. That is a term which, which involves both S and I multiplied by each other. And what, when you see a term like that, it's, it's nonlinear. It's nonlinear in, in S and I. They're, they don't just sort of add up neatly. Um, and as a result, it turns out and when you have a model like that in general, you can't solve it explicitly. You have to simulate it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, another way, though, I'd like to turn this around is so we just interpreted this, this this term as that term on the number of infections occurring per unit time. We just thought of that from a susceptibles perspective. So I'm a given susceptible, what's my chance of getting infected? I'd like to turn this around and it will give us considerable insight as um, in uh, a couple of ways. The most important one is this. So if we have S times C times I over N times beta, we can just by commutivity, we can pull the I out in front and put the S inside and we get I times C times S over N times beta. This is from the perspective of an infectious person. So if I'm a given infectious person, how many people total do I come into contact with per unit time? That's a question. How many people total do I come into contact with per unit time if I'm an infectious person? C. So I times C, and what fraction of those are susceptible? Multiply times S over N, and then multiply times beta. And, and so this is number of infectives times mean number of susceptibles infected per unit time by each um, infective person, okay? Um, the notable thing here, folks, is that there's S over N here. And what this is telling us is that the number of, of infections that a given infectable infective can cause depends on the number of susceptibles around them. If you have lots of susceptibles and you're an infective, are you going to be, are you going to be um, infecting, uh, well, suppose you're infecting a large number of people. As the number of susceptibles around you drops, 
your efficiency in spreading that infection will drop as well. You have to go further, you have to meet more people to have that chance you'll infect more. If you're surrounded by people who are who have already had the bug or are vaccinated, you're not going to infect many people. Um, because you're going to be only rarely bumping into that susceptible that's um, that's that's um, subject to, to infection. So in short, as the number of susceptibles drops, so does the ability, the efficiency with which infectives can can spread. Okay, so it's this is a key term that limits the spread of infection in the population, and it's this quantity that plays one of the key roles in governing the spread of infection uh, dynamically. Okay, so here's our um, uh, here's our model. Okay, so I'd like to to build up this model right now. Okay. Um, so uh, those of you who have your computers um, with you, we're going to go over to Vensum right now, uh, call this up, and we're going to do a few simple, um, uh, a, a few simple uh, runs with it. So I'd like you to create a new model. And for a time step of this, I'd like you to choose um, uh, a smaller time step, OK? Um, say, uh, 0.0625 is the time step. Okay, um, so I just I just called this up um, uh, when I said file new new model. Okay, um, so I just created a new model. So I did file new again and, and picked 0625, and I unclick this save results every time step. You folks can keep it clicked or not. Um, okay, so so this is um, uh, a new model. Sorry, I thought I. Open that, but uh, okay, fine. There we go. Okay, so let's let's put down. Um, okay, Neil Neil can't see this right now, I think. Um, so let me switch over the window so that uh, he can. So I'm going to stop sharing that, and I'm going to start sharing. So please, folks, start adding in susceptible, infective, infectives, and recovered, and. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll join you in just a second here. Application sharing, share entire desktop. Okay, so here we go. So we're gonna add in here susceptible, susceptibles. Um, let me make sure I, I call it susceptible. So I'll call it with, uh, without the S at the end. And then infective, um, and then I call it recovered, okay, recovered. Now, to add these in, I'm again using these, uh, these stocks up here, so-called box variables. Now, um, we're going to then add in um, the flows between them, which is where the action happens. So we need to add in a flow uh, into susceptibles that's associated with immigration, right? And then we're going to add a flow between susceptible and infected that's associated with um, infection, or inc I call it incidence. Um, and then infective recovered that's called recovery, okay? Um, and uh, we're gonna insert some variables here. Average duration of infectiousness is gonna be one of them. So average duration of infectiousness. Um, and then we're further going to add in a variable that's called fractional prevalence. And we're going to actually break this out into a little bit um, more detail than is shown um, this sh th whoa, than is shown in this slide here, um, the slide behind here. I'm going to do this for didactic reasons. And in fact, I think I have an earlier one that is, uh, do I not? There, uh, there we go, force of infection, OK? So, so this is closer to, to what I want. Okay, so we're going to have a fractional prevalence. We're going to also have a variable called total population. Okay, um, total population, um, which we're going to use to compute fractional prevalence. And then there's going to be a variable called, um, uh, well, it's going to be C, contacts um, per, I'll call it contacts per unit time. I'm choosing my, my labels here a little bit um, loosely. And then there's going to be per contact, per contact, I'm going to say likelihood of infection, okay? Um, 
So uh, just so we're clear, contacts per unit time, what variable is that in our, what have we been calling that? C, that's C, right. I'm going to call it C. And what is per contact likelihood of infection? Beta, good. Um, okay, so, so I've, I've specified these things and I'm going to have force of infection, of infection. That's going to be the chance per unit time that somebody um, that is susceptible will get infected. And finally, I'm going to have um, a, I think I had it in this later one, um, I apologize here, uh, immigration rate, okay, immigration rate. Um, okay, so now I want you folks to tell me. So we've just sort of articulated the skeleton of this. I want you folks to tell me now, how do I hitch this up? What needs to be connected with what? Okay, good. Immigration rate to immigration flow. By the way, why would I break this out as a separate variable? Why not just set it there? Turns out that, that Benson provides modes where I can tweak this very explicitly, but other, also it's, um, uh, by having it as a separate variable, I might, uh, I might have it, for example, be uh, depended on um, by, by other things in different, different ways. It's a little bit arguable here, because um, I could have the flow depended on, I suppose. Um, but uh, fundamentally, I can adjust this more readily in Benson than I, than I can this flow. So that's, a, that's an arguable thing. But OK, so what else depends on what? People should be able to tell me. So I'm now in this, in this connector mode. So what else, what else here depends on other variables? It impacts what? OK, good, excellent. And what else impacts recovery? Yeah, yeah, number of infectives. If there's no one infective, there can't be anyone to recover, right? Who's going to be recovering if there's no one to recover? Who's a subject to recovery, right? OK, so good. So there's a feedback there. I see a negative feedback staring me in the face. Um, Folks make it really tired of me by the end of this term. Um, okay, uh, what other things depend on other things? Okay, so let's let's uh, divide that up piece by piece. Okay, so force of infection, what does it depend on? Okay, contacts per unit time and on beta and on fractional prevalence. Okay. Um, and uh, in turn, what depends on force of infection? Why are we computing that? The infection, a yeah, number of people getting infected. What else must that depend on? Number of susceptibles. Otherwise, we'll be in a weird situation where no one can possibly be infected, but people keep on being infected, will be drawn negative. So if there's no susceptibles, there's going to be no infection. Okay. Okay, so fractional prevalence, what else does that depend on? We want to know the fraction, the total population that's infected. What does that depend on? Good. That's a good start. And what else? Number of infectives. Okay. And total population, does that depend on anything? Well, sure. In general, maybe we want to have it depend on what? Imagine if we started adding births and deaths and, and all those sort of things. In fact, we already have immigration. What should it depend on? Is this a constant here, folks, total population? No, because there is immigration coming in. So what must that depend on? All three. Yeah, all three stocks. That's right. Uh, hey. One. Boom. Um, okay. Now, those of you who are aesthetically inclined to prettify your model by, by uh, making these, these lines um, curve in nice ways. Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to make them uh, as pretty as I would like. Um, but, uh, but that's basic structure. Okay, now that we've figured out kind of the dependencies functionally, 
this is still ultimately a kind of system structure diagram. And if I go into equations mode, it's going to complain. So, ladies and gentlemen, what has to be filled in here for it to be runnable? Okay, initial values for the stocks. Okay, so I'd like you to put in 999 susceptibles. Oh, this offends my aesthetic senses. I can't stand before you as a software engineer and do that. Um, uh, okay, we're going to create a variable called initial population, okay? Um, and the number, number of susceptibles is going to be Okay, now this is, oh gosh, is it going to cause you in trouble in, in PLE? The problem is you, you can't directly have a link uh, of this sort, I think, uh, within, within your version. But um, if I say initial value of susceptible is initial population, then it's fine. I, I can't remember in PLE, does it complain there's no arrow, so you have to connect that arrow. In my version, you could actually do it without the arrow. But, sorry, it shouldn't be initial population. Initial population minus one. Why minus one? Where am I going with this? Where's the other person going to start? Infective. Or else it's going to be a pretty boring model. Is susceptible? Yeah, susceptibles is initial population minus one. And then, then initial, uh, for infective, the initial value is one. Now, if I were Dylan, I'd be tempted to think, shouldn't there be an assertion that says initial population has to be at least one um, somewhere? And it is possible to sort of engineer assertions <coughs> into Bensim um, to capture that sort of thing. Um, and I could talk uh, about it later. I think it's a good thing. We're going to start with zero recovered, OK? Um, zero, zero recovered individuals, OK? Um, OK, so. Um, so zero recovered, susceptible is initial population minus one, and effective is one. Okay. If anyone's having problems with that initial population minus one, make it minus one, and, and, or make it a thousand minus one. Better yet, why a thousand minus one? Because then at least it's explicit. You're depending it on some. I should have a thousand. If you search in your model for a thousand, you'll find it. Maybe in the in the quantity for total population, you'll find it in also there. If you if it's nine nine nine, you don't know what mathematical thing gave rise to that, and you won't find it in a search and find. Okay, so it's up to in fact to recover. What else do we have to fill in for this to be a runnable model? As time is ticking. Okay, immigration. Good. Um, so I actually have some uh, some slides where. I ask for a certain, okay, so immigration, I'd like it to be zero, okay? Um, immigration rate zero. For now, we're gonna be dealing with a closed model. And immigration, okay, so immigration rate is zero. Average duration of infectiousness, I would like to be um, 10, 10 days, okay? Um, and uh, we could, uh, we should really set this model to have, uh, we should do model settings. Um, uh, no, I don't want to do that. Make it units of time, days, if you want. Um, okay, uh, so average duration of infectiousness is 10. Uh, what are the things do we have to specify constants for? C, make 10 also, 10, 10 people. Oh, sorry, it's, it is per month. I'm sorry, folks, I, I thought it was per day. Um, so this should actually be month. So the month was correct, okay. So contacts per unit time is 10. Per contact likelihood of transmission, 0.04. So that's a 4% chance of transmission per discordant contact. In other words, per SI contact. Sure. 10. And that's 10 months. You'll notice actually it allows you to specify units. We'll get to that later in the class. But you can do unit checking and Vensim. It will make sure you're not adding people per month to people or adding dollars to deer or something like that. Um, okay, sorry? And then uh, uh, contacts per unit time is 10. What was beta? Uh, so that's 10 person per month. Beta is 0.04. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and for the initial population, make it 1,000. Okay. So 
Anyone who missed that? Average duration of illness, 10. Initial population, 1,000. Immigration rate, 0. Context per unit time, 10. Beta, 0.04. Okay. Okay, um, okay. So, so s tell me some more things I have to fill in. There's one. There's one formula here that's trivial. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's go up that. What what is that then? Sum of all those. The sum of all those things. Susceptible plus infective plus recovered. Right. So, okay. Good. Okay. So it just depends on on those three. Okay, what's another thing that's trivial here? Okay, that one, uh, okay, let's, let's do that. So what is that? Okay, good. Infective divided by total population. And there's actually a way to do it in Venison that it will be robust so that even if the denominator is zero, then it will, it, it will handle it properly. Um, but I won't trouble you with that uh, right now. Okay, uh, what's another one that's really, really easy? Uh, sorry, the initial population we set to 1,000. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what's another one that's super easy, though? There's actually one that's, one thing is just equal to the other. What's that? Immigration. So what is immigration value? It's just the immigration rate. So if we measure immigration rate in persons per month, then immigration flow is just that, okay? Okay, well, that's what I was saying earlier. It's because Vensim has a mode where you can adjust these guys, but not the, the actual flows directly. Uh, I like breaking it out conceptually because then I, I look for the actual constants at a separate point also. But, but really, it's kind of a marginal situation except for that adjustment thing in this case. Um, <coughs> if anything else depended on this, it's kind of nice to have it this used rather than the flow. But but you could argue either way. Okay, so give me the final ones here. Okay, force of infection. Okay, let's go to that last because that, that will be the culmination, the triumph of this class. Okay, and, and you can leave in an ebullient mood, ready to take on the world. Um, okay, so, so give me another one to fill in. Infection, okay, so what is that going to be? Number of susceptibles, yeah. I, as a as a general, rule, like to put the stocks times the 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 sort of um, coefficient, but that that's fine. Yeah, let's do force of infection times susceptible. So, force of infection again is the chance per unit time a given susceptible will get infected. So we have to multiply when we figure out how many infections per month there are, or we have to say okay, number of susceptibles times the chance for each of them. Get infected. So if there's a thousand susceptibles and there's a one percent chance they'll each get infected on average will be ten per month. That that go. It's one percent chance per month. Okay. How about for recovery? How about the recovery one? Number of people per month recovering. Oh close. So you've recognized the pattern here. Divided by. So what was what was recognized quite correctly is that this is a what? We talked about it a lot last time. First order delay, remember that? And the formula for the outflow of first order delay is either the number the, the, the quantity in that stock times what? The chance per unit time that they'll leave. Maybe 10% chance per unit time that they'll you know, go on and, and recover. Or it's that stock divided by what? The mean time in that. Remember that? I said you could you could phrase it either way, and that's because, ladies and gentlemen, with a first order delay, the chance per unit time is one over the average time in that stock. 
or put another way, the average time in that stock is 1 over the chance per unit time of leaving. Got that? You can do that back. Um, okay, so it's number of infectives divided by average, infect average duration of, in of infectiousness. Okay, and now, ladies and gentlemen, does anyone have any question about that? Does that make sense? Okay, so if we had a thousand people infected and we had a long, long time till they recovered, 100 months on average, we'd have a lower flow out, right? Than if, if per, per unit time, than if they were a thousand people and you know, they had only one month to come out, they'd be coming out of the, the woodwork. Whereas if if a hundred months to come out, those thousand people would bleed out very, very slowly. Right? Okay. Um, okay. So now we're on to the belly of the beast, the force of infection. Can anyone, using that logic, talk to me? Over? Remember, the force of infection is the chance per unit time a given susceptible get infected. So we have these susceptibles. Think about that susceptible. Can anyone now build up for me using that same sort of reasoning? The, the formula here for for that chance for unit you know, time of infection. We went through the rehearsal earlier, and now it's time to yeah yeah contacts per unit time. So they have hundred contacts with anyone times the fractional prevalence. Maybe the fractional prevalence is fifty percent in the population, 0.5 in other words. So they have a contacts with 50 what per month on average? Infective individuals. And then there's a per contact likelihood of infection from each of those infective individuals. Boom. Ladies and gentlemen, you have now built your first model of, of infection trans. Well, I, I think it's your first. If this isn't your first, you, you deserve even more praise. Um, uh, okay, so what I'm going to go there is, is put in and call SIR model. I have to put these um, online, so I'll just call it first SIR model. Okay, now let's see if we can run this. I'm going to run. Oh, look at that. It ran. Okay, what do you think we should see? Well, um, this, is, this is what we'll see like that. And uh, given the time, uh, we're going to have to finish up this discussion and then go on to agent-based modeling next time. But what we should see is something like this. <laughs> Do you not see something like that? I don't know. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, uh, my, my condolences. Um, the, the crowning achievement <laughs> stolen by an ugly fact. Um, the analog world intrudes on a beautiful digital triumph. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I feel your pain. Um, so, uh, this is the number of infectives over time. What should the number of susceptibles... So, so, can anyone describe to me, give me a story accompanying this. What's going on here? We've seen it before. I've, I've alluded to it. What's going on here? A, a sort of a, a, a story. So. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, and what we'll see next time is there's a very nice stock and flow description associated with this. So the number of individuals who are getting affected is transmitted person to person in a very quick way. A, a positive feedback, a reinforcing feedback. One person affects two, affects four, affects eight, and it's spreading rapidly. Now that lasts only as long as there's very few, uh, very few. Uh, you know, you're surrounded by susceptible people. But once there's fewer and fewer susceptibles surrounding each person, it doesn't go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to 64 to 128 to 250. Well, okay. Um, I could go on. I'd love them. But um, <laughs> uh, now it's going to go up more slowly. If you're starting to be surrounded by susceptibles, it's going to go up very, uh, you know, it's going to go up slower. And the more and more susceptibles surrounding you, the slower that's going to rise. The, the more and more in hard it's going to be to transmit that infection. 
And at the same time, the number of infectives, ladies and gentlemen, that's a function of how many new people are getting infected, which is what I was alluding to there. But it's also a function of what? If we look at our model, the number of people are infected. That's affected by the rate at which people are getting infected, to be sure. And that's getting less and less efficient over time because they're getting surrounded by more and more people who they can't infect because they're already infected or they're recovered, right? There's fewer and fewer susceptibles surrounding each of these infectives. So there's, there's um, uh, less and less uh, sort of people coming in here per unit time. But what's the other thing that affects the number of infectives, ladies and gentlemen? The number of recoveries. That's right. So if we consider this flow, this is going up as long as what? The number of infectives is rising as long as the what is greater than the what? Inflow is greater than the outflow. The, the rate of people per unit time, say people per month who are getting infected, is greater than the number of people per month who are recovering. And when it reaches this peak here, that's the point at which what? Yeah, there's, there's, they're equal. So the number of recoveries per month is equal to the number of infections per month. Now, after that point, not unless you have immigration and so on, there's going to be the situation. It's going to get even harder for those people who are infective to, to infect anyone. They're getting less and less efficient at transmitting because they're surrounded by fewer and fewer susceptibles. And meanwhile, you know, this is at a peak in the number of people infected, and so the number of people recovering per month is, is quite large. And so you're going to have a further drop in the inflow and in in quite a large outflow, and so it's going to drag down the number of infectives. And that's going to mean each susceptible now, who still survived to this point, is less and less likely to get infected, be infected because there are fewer and fewer infectives to infect them anymore. And so you have this turnaround and the number of infectives dies out. There's also an individual level story for each of those infections during this whole point here while they're rising, this is rising, that individual is going to be infecting more than one person before they recover. Initially they're going to be infecting potentially quite a number, but as this goes up they're getting less and less efficient. And at this point they're just replacing themselves. They're only reflecting one person on average before they recover at this peak. On this part here, they're infecting less than one person. Um, so when they recover, there's, there's fewer people infected than when they started. So the number of infectives is, is dropping, dropping rapidly here. So in terms of the feedbacks, this this upswing is dominated by the reinforcing feedback associated with infection spread. What we saw earlier uh, in terms of um, oh come on where is it um, uh, this this feedback here a um, number of new infectives uh, infections leading to more infectives leading to more contacts and new infections. But it's starting to deplete the number of susceptibles, and and that is leading to this thing to sort of uh, plateau out. And then this feedback involving new recoveries subtracting away from infectives becomes dominant, and it, it drags it down so that the number of infectives is almost zero. So let me ask this as a final question before you leave here. If we were to look at susceptibles, what should we expect to see? Okay, is it total depletion, depletion or is it partial depletion? These are the questions that try men's intuition, well, try person's intuition. Um, I was quoting Thomas Paine, but uh, uh, he, he phrased it in a non-gender neutral way. It actually goes down, and it needn't be totally depleted. Goes down, and it it plateaus off. 
These people here, why aren't they getting infected? Yeah, the number of, of, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, this number of susceptibles is so low that an infective can't, they can't even replace themselves as infected before they recover. On average, they, they infect less than one person before they recover. So the infection does not sustain itself in the population. We have a sort of herd immunity where a given person may be susceptible, but the population as a whole is immune to infection. It's just not going to be, there's so many people who are no longer susceptible that it's just not going to take hold. It's not going to spread effectively. It's like you throw down a match on wet ground, wet with, with water, not with gasoline. And, and it, it, you know, it's, it's just not going to spread effectively. So it's, it's going to peter out. That's what's going to happen here. And so these folks here that are still remaining in the susceptible category um, are, are protected by the fact that infection really can't spread. If there are the occasional infected who comes in to the population, arrives at the Saskatoon airport, it's just not going to catch. There's just not enough people around for them on average to, to infect, uh, to make a, a difference and start an epidemic. Okay, maybe if they're lucky, they'll spread it. Well, I don't know if lucky or unlucky. If they're, if, if they may be in a situation they spread it to one other person, but then that person's likely to die out. So it dies out. So there actually are some susceptibles. And if you were to go into synthesim mode and Vensim, and you know, I'll put in an alternative here, alternative uh, scenario, and with the same parameters originally, and we'll run this in synthesim mode. What we can see is that as we change, say, the number of contacts per unit time, um, here we, we, have, uh, we raise the number of contacts per unit time. Now the number of susceptibles is de being depleted to a lower level. Or I could lower the contacts per unit time to something like, and I'm doing a calculation here, um, right. Uh, so I'll lower this to, uh, say, uh, six, okay, and here we have an infection that that spreads. It's spreading slower, but the number of susceptibles. Well, if you were to run it out, it would actually asymptote out at quite a larger level, uh, quite a larger level indeed. Now the interesting question, folks, and it's with this that you can puzzle over till till um, Thursday. Let's suppose I lowered the contacts per unit time to to um, uh, a very small value here, and I'm going to have to think for just a moment. Um, so, uh, right, if we lowered it to say two, um, where's the number of susceptible? The red. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Red. Red shows that reference scenario that we ran earlier. Blue is the alternative now. I set it to be two contacts per unit time. Where is? the number of susceptibles? It's way up at the top. It's not changing. I could run this out to the cows come home and beyond, and, and that will not be declining. Why not? That is an issue of a tipping point, and there's no epidemic that's occurring. Here, the infection is not spreading efficiently enough and if, if it's introduced by that one person who starts infected, it peters out immediately. So what we're seeing is the existence of a tipping point. And m much, much of the efforts at public health intervention related to infectious disease indeed relate to the sort of parameters you see here. Treating people more quickly relates to average duration of infectiousness. Um, reducing the contact rates you know, by closing schools affects contacts per unit time. Hygienic practices affect this per contact likelihood of infection. And finally, you can move people out of the susceptible stock into a protected stock for vaccinated, essentially moving them to the recovered stock um, through vaccination. So what we're seeing here is a situation where the public health system tries to achieve that state we just observed, that state where susceptibles doesn't have to decline in that way because the 
the parameters of the situation are such that the infection won't spread with enough efficiency to catch hold. Okay? So um, we've seen this in a stock and flow context here. We'll talk a little bit more uh, about it next time, reinforce some of these notions, and we will go on to our first experience with agent-based modeling to look at this in a more detailed way with, um, with spatial spread of infection as well. Okay? Okay, so uh, that's all for today. And uh, again, for those who are, um, who are doing um, uh, in this class for credit, you will uh, want to be thinking about projects. Please make, make appointments with me if you do need to contact. Remind, reminder that my office hours are on Thursday if you need to talk about projects or you need to talk about, um, about the problem set. I'm also available for appointments one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Do you want to use the blackboard? Yeah, uh, the whiteboard. Right sure. And so that process is Yep. And so the what ends up happening if you were to look at a histology slide with a whole bunch of cells, so this is lung tissue, you'd have some that would be infected with the actual virus. There wouldn't be very many, and then you'd have all these other cells. So...